Thank you, Professor Kandi, as well as Professor Vijay Kumar. Good morning, everyone. In fact, they are more fatherly figures to me, so I think it may be the other way, the introduction. I'm going to talk about the IPF update 2022, and uh, I'm very clear I'm not going to talk about the ATS guidelines of 2018, which you already presumably know, and I'm going to focus on the document which came as an update for the IPF guidelines in 2022. That is the uh, Blue Journal, which has published it. And uh, Dr. Candy has already alluded to some of the basic things which are there in this, which are the new ones. And of course, they would be of great help to the uh, young pulmonologists to know that they have finally agreed to change some of the things in them and accept the new things which are coming up. And that's what the whole thing is about. So I'm going to discuss about two aspects of IPF. What is new in the diagnosis and what is new in the treatment. So quickly going on to the diagnosis. Now, what they have decided is that, uh, you know, you need to define the lung fibrosis in a more elucid manner where everybody can understand what a lung fibrosis is. After the COVID, as everybody said, that we learned a lot of fibrosis actually just melts away. So the lung fibrosis is now confidently recognized when two things are there, either traction bronchiectasis or bronchiolectasis, or there is honeycombing. And Dr. Gothi also very nicely told you that it is the honeycombing which is the end stage of the fibrotic lungs. So this fibrotic lung which has these two elements is the one which we are going to talk about in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. What honeycombing actually means is that these are the terminal bronchiolar dilatations, which again Dr. Gothi said that these are just the continuation of them. And then there is a lot of uh, uh, collapse of the alveolar septae, which ultimately leads to pulling off the terminal airways, which turn into the cysts and they form this uniform kind of cysts, which are of definite size, multiple number, and as well as sharing the walls. They brought some new terminologies not to confuse this kind of a presentation in the clinical practice by bringing in a term which is called airspace enlargement with fibrosis. So when there are clustered asymmetric cysts that are larger and more irregular than what we see in honeycombing cysts, as well as there is no traction bronchiectasis, this is a typical picture of what is the uh, paraseptal emphysema or what has been previously described as the smoking-related interstitial fibrosis. But what they also mentioned is it should not be labeled as a new variant of idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. It's just a smoking-related lung, dis lung disease. In the role of uh, definite UIP, we all know that the uh, honeycombing is the primary thing which we look for when we say that this is definite UIP. And that is a typical subplural, lower low predominant, reticular abnormalities, and they are associated with so-called this honeycombing. Clearly seen in these three pictures, and they are all basilar, peripheral, that classical picture of honeycomb which you see. But the one more thing which they have mentioned and brought a change is, you don't need to be stuck of two or three layers, a single layer, of subpleural cyst can also be a manifestation of honeycombing and may be considered as the initial presentation of honeycombing itself. And it is not only that when you see an IPF fibrotic lungs, they are purely fibrotic. This kind of traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis may be also associated with some amount of GGOs. Previously, it was always talked about that no GGOs are required. So some GGOs may be there, but they should not be out of proportion. And also, they emphasized that a UIP pattern, which still the radiologists keep on reporting as IPF, is not IPF surrogate marker only, and it is seen in CTD ILDs, chronic HP, as well as other exposure-related ILDs. Coming to UIP pattern on HRCT to distinguish with the chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, they have given the four signs that if it is an upper and a mid-lung predominance, raise the red flag, diffuse bronchovascular fibrosis, seal or axial plates, raise the red flag, and when there is sparing of extreme CP angles on coronal planes, then again raise the flag. And of course, three density sign is a sign which is 
very, very uh, considered as a way of confident diagnosis to be made by radiologists in MDD for chronic HP. Similarly, for the CTD-related ILD versus IPF, again, that straight edge sign, exuberant honeycombing, and anterior upper lobe signs are retained. But now the honeycombing in this uh, kind of uh, exuberant nature seen in CTDs have been defined more clearly when more than 70% of the fibrotic area in the lungs show honeycombing. That is what is called as exuberant honeycombing. And that's uh, perhaps a marker to evaluate the patient for CTD-related UIP pattern and not an IPF. Pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis which is one of the rare IIPs which has been reported before. Now it has been reported in IPF cases also, and about 6 to 10% of patients of IPF will also have pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis. And whenever you pick it up, it has certain things to tell us. One, it is associated with rapid decline in lung function. Two, it leads to higher risk of development of pneumothorax as well as pneumobidiastylum and it is associated with poor survival. So this is combined PPFE with IPF pattern, which is seen in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Bringing on the confusion of probable UIP, they had a lot of debate where they wanted to combine both of them together because probable UIP in a right clinical setting is actually an IPF and IPF with UIP is also with the right clinical setting IPF only. But however, they realize that there are subtle differences when you use the term probable UIP and hence it cannot be clubbed with the UIP pattern. So the reason being, there is a lot of overlap of this probable UIP in other fibrosing ILDs too. So it's not that it is always associated with a IPF. Then, the probable UIP pattern has a less correlation to UIP pattern on histopathology vis-a-vis -vis what you see in definite UIP radiology and a definite UIP on pathology, where it is to the tune of 95%. In probable UIP, it is about 85%. So it's not that concurrent that this uh, terminology can be taken as synonymous with definite UIP. And of course, uh, the, the, the value of uh, probable UIP in other clinical settings, like where you suspect that it could be chronic HP or CTD-related ILD, it is just not known. So at the moment, it is too premature to close these two entities together. And also, the data suggests that perhaps patients with probable UIP pattern on an HRCT vis-a-vis -vis a definite UIP pattern have a better survival, which again Dr. Gothi said that he's seeing this UIP pattern and they do all do bad. But probable UIP patients do not do equally bad, and hence they have a better survival in some of the studies, but not, of course, uh, there are big studies to do that. And also, Probable UIP pattern when you see in young people, then it is very difficult to find a pathological UIP pattern on the histopathology. So be very, very of uh, uh, using the terminology of probable UIP in a patient with uh, uh, age less than 50 years and inferring it that it is most likely an IPF. A couple of things in the pathology of uh, IPF, where again the UIP versus probable UIP features are being discussed. And you can see the classical four features of UIP, that there is a patchy, dense fibrosis with architectural destruction, predilection for subplural uh, as well as paraseptal lung parenchyma, presence of fibroblastic foci, and absence of features suggestive of alternative diagnosis. That's why it is a little red color, because this is a must. In a pathology, there should be nothing to suggest that there can be an alternative diagnosis for a definite UIP. In probable UIP, it is said that you may have a couple of features, not entirely four. You may have two, you may have three, you may have one. But now the most important difference brought in here is that the point number four, where we have said that the absence of alternative diagnosis should also be there in the histopathology is a must for also leaving at 
probable UIP by the pathologist. So alternative diagnosis should not be missed in probable UIP. That is, the, I think, the, the uh, most important uh, the message from this slide. So <clears throat> now, after a lot of debate, Finally, the transbronchial cryo-lung biopsy has been included into the uh, guidelines. Previous guidelines ignored it, and uh, the only thing which has happened after that is there are two meta-analyses and uh, one uh, big trial which tried to look into the role of TBLC in the diagnosis of uh, uh, interstitial lung diseases, particularly when you have uh, ILD of undetermined origin. So now the recommendation is that we suggest TBLC, and it is an excellent, uh, ex acceptable alternative to surgical lung biopsy in patients of ILD of undetermined style and type, and very importantly, at the medical centers who have experience in performing it as well as interpreting it. So it's not only the expertise uh, which is required, but also expertise of the pathologist to interpret that surgery, the, the transbronchial cryo-lung biopsies. Because the concordance is dependent upon how good the MDD is run with an experienced pathology. They did mention about complications of the meta-analysis, cumulative data showing pneumothorax in 9%, any kind of bleeding in 30%, and severe bleeding Pre, uh, sorry, post-procedural mortality, exacerbations, respiratory infections, and persistent air leaks after transbronchial cryo-lung biopsies to be rare. So there is a conditional recommendation given to it. You can see lots of people agreed to it out of 22. I think almost about 14 to 15 people agreed to cryobiopsies. Diagnostic yield is to the tune of 79%. And it is generally 85% if, if you obtain three cryo-lung biopsy specimens. Agreement between the surgical and the cryo-lung biopsies is to the tune of 70%. But if you use MDD, then it reaches nearly about 77%, which is as good as with the surgical lung biopsy. Not as good as, but yes, nearly to that value. And they also identified the group of patients from the various clinical trials of transbronchial uh, cryo-lung biopsy, those who are likely to develop complications and are at high risk for the procedure, where you really need to understand that whether the biopsy is going to change the diagnosis and translate to change in treatment. And then only you take it because the, where the risk is high, then the outcomes has to be uh, definitely out of proportion to suggest or to actually allow you to do that procedure. So the risk of complications are high when BMI is more than 35, age is more than 75, FVC is less than 50%, DLCO less than 30%, systolic pulmonary artery pressure more than 40, and a significant cardiac disease. Patabi is smiling away that these are anyways the usual complications you see, but very importantly, by the time you see these fibrotic lungs and they are into this confusion and the dilemma as whether it is IPF or a ILD of some other cause, the lung functions are generally in this range only. And at that point, you nearly need to take a call to do a cryobiopsy in these patients. But in that case, you really need to evaluate two things, the risk on one side and the potential benefit after obtaining the diagnosis. That's the very important aspect because is it going to ask yourself the question, is it going to change the line of management and treatment, which is ultimately going to affect the survival of the patient? If yes, then the risk is definitely uh, not so significant in comparison to ultimate effect on the survival of the patient. And then finally, they brought in this genomic classifier uh, testing into a uh, lot of uh, discussion. But uh, by and large, people agreed that it is yet too soon to recommend a genomic classifier testing, which is uh, done on the lung biopsies uh, obtained by a transbronchial lung biopsy in patients of UIP or in the patients of ILD of undetermined origin for various reasons. And one of them is that it has a low sensitivity, which is like 68%, insufficient data at present, Unclear downstream pathways. You do not know that if it comes out to be positive, it only tells you it is UIP, but it does not tell you that it is IPF. So if it comes out to be negative, it does not rule out IPF, and you have no clear pathway what to do and whether to apply it in a transbronchial cryo-lung biopsy or not. 
because the data is that if you have not been able to achieve the confident diagnosis in cases of ILD of undetermined origin by doing a cryobiopsy of the lung, then even if you subject these patients to surgical lung biopsy, you will not improve your diagnostics, you will still remain the same. So ultimately what it means is that if you have a cryolung biopsy which is inconclusive, go back and reevaluate at your MDDs to achieve the diagnosis. No point in pursuing these patients further for a surgical lung biopsy. So this uh, NVESIA classifier platform which they have used, this is basically uh, uses three to five transbronchial biopsies. It tries to look at whole uh, transcriptase library of the uh, RNA which is pooled from this specimen and it looks at a very sophisticated algorithm to pick up those areas, uh, those uh, kind of mutations which are suggestive of these patients having UIP on a transbronchial lung biopsy. So no recommendation at the present for both using it or not using it, but definitely much more work is required on that. Finally, coming to the diagnostic grid. This is the last slide on the diagnostic part of IPF. What have they changed? You can see that four new changes have been brought in. IPF suspected. So in IPF suspected is a person who has an unexplained pattern of bilateral pulmonary fibrosis, bibasilar crackles, and age more than 60 years. And they have dropped this age to 40 to 60 years if there is a familial ILD in the family where there are uh, siblings or the other family members who are suffering from the interstitial lung disease. So this suspect category has now these two elements which have been identified here. And in the histopathology pattern, the important thing was to actually uh, uh, use transbronchial cryolung biopsies because this grid was made with surgical lung biopsy. So they could not change it much. There are certain changes in it. But what it means is that when you use uh, transbronchial cryolung biopsy, in that case, these, the, the level of confidence needs to be dropped in comparison to surgical lung biopsy. So there will be some indeterminate, but this indeterminate category which is left here is only those patients who do not have a surgical lung biopsy at all, or those who have on cryo lung biopsy still remain indeterminate where they are asking you to go back to MDD to get your diagnosis. Severity and extent of traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis, age, sex, bowel lymphocytosis and extensive reticulations of more than 30% as well as male above 70 years have been all added into the criteria of suspect IPF where the chances of it coming IPF are very high. And finally, the last slide on the treatment part. Nothing, no talk on antifibrotics, but only question is being addressed of the anti-reflux therapy and using the anti-reflux treatment. So initial guidelines said that give it to all, and it is on the base that 90% do have acid reflux and high prevalence of hydrocernia. But the important issue was to see that whether this treatment leads to better respiratory-related outcomes or not. Does it decrease the disease progression, improve the mortality, decrease the exacerbations and hospitalizations, and improve the lung functions? And unfortunately, all the data and the research did not actually come up with a positive signal, and hence, it was recommended that if you want to use an anti-reflux therapy, then go ahead and use it for the patients who have symptomatic GERD and treat them on the lines of GERD-related uh, uh, treatment where the outcomes will be related to GERD and not the improvement in the lung conditions of the patients of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And lastly, because of the trial which used the anti-reflux surgery coming out to be negative, so there, is a, there, there was a recommendation line which came that surgical complications can occur in 15% of patients, and we suggest do not refer the patients of IPF for a routine anti-reflux surgery. So to conclude, Clarity on UIP and a diagnostic algorithm little more clear than what it was in 2018. Conditional recommendation to include cryo lung biopsy, which I think is very relevant to India, where surgical lung biopsy is almost elusive. 
and cryo lung biopsy at the centers, very, very good centers like Pattavi is there and so many others are there who are performing this is something which is a way forward in ILD of undetermined origin in India, where even at the age of 65 years and above, the chances of being a non-idiopathic IPF would be still a consideration and hence a biopsy done by a cryo lung biopsy would be a future ahead for us as far as India is concerned. No recommendation for genomic classifier, and of course the recommendations for anti-reflux only when they have symptomatic GERD, not routinely to each and every patient. With that, I would like to thank you all for listening to me. But we have a lot of unanswered questions and looking for them in the next couple of years.